Well, good morning. Got to kind of settle my soul, watching our crew minister to us like that. Um, Any time uh, you're asked to uh, address an ethnic group, um, you're, you're forced into some generalizations that I'm not sure ultimately uh, that it's helpful. So, so what I want to do, having got, and I remember the emotion I felt when I opened up the email and it just said, hey, we would love for you to discuss, the council is confident in your ability to discuss the inconsistencies in white evangelicals on the issues of race and the way forward. Oh, and you have 30 minutes. So he, here's, here's how I think I can serve us. I don't want to talk about fools today. I, I just don't, I don't have the time nor the inclination to discuss foolishness. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a group of people that God has knit my heart to. Uh, I am the pastor of the Village Church in Dallas, Texas. It is, it is a predominantly white congregation situated in a place where more than likely we will always be predominantly white. I don't feel an impulse to need to apologize for that uh, or feel bad about that. That is the reality of God's call on my life. It's where I've been placed. It's the ministry that God has given me. And I deeply love the men and women of the Village Church. I have for 15 years wept with them, buried them, married them. They have wept with me. They have visited me in the hospital. I have visited them in the hospital. They are my people and God is our God. That is the context that I find. But here's, here's something I noticed and this gets me into our journey. The, this people I love, this people that, that support me and applaud me and encourage me and through their tithes and offerings pay my bills. would operate in some inconsistencies that were discombobulating to me. If I preached a sermon out of the book of Isaiah on justice, my inbox would fill with their glee that I would broach the subject, but if I applied it to the subject of race, then then all of a sudden I was a Marxist or I'd been watching too much of the liberal media. If I spoke on abortion, uh, I was applauded as courageous and a ferocious man of God, and yet when I would tackle race, I was being too political. If I quoted the great reformer, Martin Luther, never, and I've done that hundreds of times over 15 years, never did I get an email about his blatant anti-Semitism. But let me quote the great reformer, Martin Luther King Jr., and watch my inbox fill with people asking me if I'm aware of his moral brokenness. I want to be careful because these are people that I love. These are people who love the Word of God. They are crazy. Like if I, I finished like a year and a half through the book of Exodus and I did a topical series and I started getting questions about when we were going to start preaching through the books of the Bible again. These are people who pray and worship and evangelize and love Jesus. And yet there were these inconsistencies around this topic that were confusing to me. And again, I'm not talking about fools. 300 fools left when we first broached the subject. And there, weren't, there wasn't any lament in our elder room about that other than the normal lament that you lament concerning a fool. So I want to try to explain as best I can the inconsistencies in the white evangelicals that I have been called to lead around race. I I think there's a cascading effect and it starts with ignorance. And let me chat about ignorance. Uh, I think what I'm talking about on ignorance is they don't know what they don't know and they are a part of a system that encourages their not knowing. Let, let me just lay this before you. I am a public school kid. My kids are public school kids. And he, he, here's, here's what I've done leading up to this. I have asked 30 
white men and women that I know and love to tell me who they learned about during Black History Month. Among the 30 plus men and women starting at age 12 all the way up to 60, I was given seven names. Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, Frederick Douglass, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., George Washington Carver, Malcolm X. If this is all we know, then intellectual, innovative, creative African Americans are anomalies, they are not normal. These brothers and sisters are outliers. They are not what I should come to expect in my interactions with African Americans. There's nothing about the great migration. How can you understand the layout of the United States of America without knowing about the great migration? How can you understand ghettos without understanding the great migration? Nothing, I mean nothing about Benjamin Banneker who laid out Washington DC. I don't need to keep going here, but the list is long and extensive and we don't know it. We don't know about housing disparity because we're snuggled in affluent suburbs where no one will lay that data in front of us. And even if that data is in front of us, our education has taught us that's not on us, that's on y'all. I'm being careful because I love these people. I love them. Then as we move to world history, I am taught nothing of Africa that would lead me to believe that Africans were not just running around the jungle with no homes, houses, cities, architecture, or culture. They are wearing leaves. They have spears. They are basic and uneducated. I am not taught about their architecture or engineering, although I will be taught about the pyramids, but we want to make sure that Northern Africa is not the same thing as Africa. I am not taught that in Zimbabwe and Mozambique there are massive stone complexes that were hubs of great cities and civilizations. I know nothing of a 270 yard long 15,000 ton curved granite wall. I know nothing of architecture. I know nothing of system. I, I don't know that math was birthed in Africa. So there is now nothing in how the majority of white men and women are educated that would lead us to believe that Africans and African Americans are intellectual, innovative or creative, except a couple of y'all in sports and entertainment. I'm also taught that racism is unleashing dogs and spraying with hoses. So I certainly cannot be a racist. There is a seed of doubt sown in the mind of whites that blacks have a work ethic or the capacity to help us. It's why even when white men and women of good heart engage, it can oftentimes come across as paternalistic. That y'all need our help. I cannot, I have lost count of the number of young, gifted, godly, beautiful African-American, Latino, Asian church planters who have tried to partner with white churches, who have tried to do the things that we have heard from this stage and have been treated like children, not co-laborers. I can only imagine how such an education, I see what it creates in whites, I can only imagine how such an education, to quote King, helps create ominous clouds of inferiority in the mental skies of African Americans. So surely now if we move to how Christians are, and by the way, I just talked about, I didn't say a word about private school. I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> Let me stop for a second. I don't hate my people. 
you, you can save that. E- you don't have to send me that email about how I hate my folk because I don't hate my folk. My Christian education seems to have jumped from the book of Acts to the Wittenberg door. Thomas C. Oden, I think I saw that brother at dinner. I fanboyed out. I couldn't even go introduce myself. He, he said, cut Africa out of the Bible and Christian memory and you have misplaced many pivotal scenes of salvific history. It is the story of the children of Abraham in Africa, Joseph in Africa, Moses in Africa, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus in Africa, and shortly thereafter, Mark and Petua and Athanasius and Augustine in Africa. The theological developments in North Africa laid the hermeneutical foundations that brought clarity to the Trinity. Martin Luther and the Ethiopian church is just now being dove into. To Luther, the church of Ethiopia had more fidelity to Christian tradition than the church in Rome. It was his relationship with the deacon Michael of the church in Ethiopia that led to the Reformation to begin with. This ignorance has led to immaturity. And immaturity It talks when it should listen, and it's silent when it should speak. This ignorance has led to immaturity. This immaturity has led either to hostility or withdrawal. Hostility in that I cannot be a racist because I have not unleashed a dog on you. I have not sprayed you with a fire hose, and I am not in any way trying to... um, hold you back from success apart from systems I cannot see and a history I do not know. So it makes me angry when you take a knee because you don't have an intellect. Play ball, shut up, do what you're paid for. Makes me hostile. And then when met with data, I get discombobulated so I withdraw. So where do we go from here? I, man, I hardly slept last night. Not because I was afraid to give this talk, but because I understood what I was going to be asking. White pastors, I need to chat with you. You have got to say something. Now hold up. I, here's why I didn't sleep. I know what I'm asking, man. I am not going to be fired for saying these things. I'm not. You might be. As I laid in my bed last night, I was like, oh, Lord. Like the thought of you and your family and your children, real people made in the image of God, being bullied and beaten and shoved out the door. I thought of your opportunity to join the community of those who have suffered at the hands of that same nonsense as both a blessing to you, but also a painful blow. I know what I'm asking. You've got to sit. There is no way forward if white pulpits won't talk. This king who said this rightly in the end, and you've heard this quoted multiple times, we will, be remember, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So let me, let me help. I've learned some things. I don't think your first sermon should be a sermon on white privilege. I mean, if you want to go out in a blaze of glory, <laughs> you can just preach that. But I would pre-pack. <laughs> so what then? Brothers, this is where your Bible will help you. Ethnic harmony is one of the great themes of the Bible. 
It is not isolated to Ephesians 2. It is not isolated to the book of Acts. Genesis 12 says all nations of the earth will be blessed. And Revelation 7 shows people from every tribe, tongue, and nation on earth. This is the refrain of the Bible over and over and over again. Let the nations be glad. Let the nations be glad. Let the nations be glad. It's not about a group of white folk in English singing songs that many of my good friends would call melancholy. Jesus consistently confronted broken thinking around ethnicity, and I think we miss it because we blow through our Bible too quickly and read it like we're reading a blog. No, you got to steep in it. John 10, 16, Jesus looks at a crowd and says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd, and I'm just telling you that his inbox on Monday was full. Don't you know we're the chosen people? Don't you know the Bible, Jesus? Don't you know Moses and the law? Don't you know about the tabernacle? Luke 10, 25 through 37, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. So to Charlie's point. He's got his orthodoxy down. Jesus replied, well, actually, but he, desiring to justify himself, my white brothers and sisters, that sentence is huge, but desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So now what's happening in this, you've got this story that's taking place and, and you've got kind of the Hebrew Mount Rushmore, you've got Hebrew Tom Brady going on right here. What the Levite, surely the Levite who knows the law is gonna act upon the law. What, the priest? Oh man, the priest knows what God's charged. Surely the priest is gonna, no. Look who Jesus makes the hero. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay when you come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor of the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. He wouldn't even say it. He couldn't say the Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise and don't let it, don't miss on the fact that the first person that Jesus reveals that he is the son of God to is a Samaritan woman at the well who is exchanging sex for rent. Let's not forget that one. So you gotta say something. I wouldn't start with white privilege, but you can start a lot of different places in the word of God. You should, should say something. You'll find if you just stay at the high level of unity it, your people will just applaud you. You will need to, over a period of time, begin to peel back the layers. So after that first sermon on unity goes so well, take heart, brothers, fast, pray, gear up, dig some more, and lead your people into what is true. Number two on the way forward is not just that white pastors must say something regardless of the cost, but I think a lot of this is gonna hinge on relationships. And now I wanna clarify something. I am not asking you to find the black person that agrees with you. Yeah. 
Becoming friends with the African American that agrees with everything you say isn't helpful to you as a white evangelical and probably has that African American trying to win approval or position. It is the brokenness in each of us. If I, if I could unpack kind of how I'm trying to cultivate this, in Acts 29, Doug Logan, Brandon Washington, Eric Mason, Leon's Crump, Dwayne Bond, Jer Jerome Gay, and many others have become a sounding board for me as I tried to reach out for clarity when I get confused or don't understand something. I do not agree with these men on everything. Their blackness does not make them right. It is a voice that I need to hear because I do not know or understand. So I need to figure out how to understand so I go to voices who love the Word of God like I love the Word of God, are passionate about Jesus like I'm passionate about Jesus, who can help me understand history, background, and the development of thinking that I'll need to faithfully steward what God has entrusted to me. This also enables me to champion their voices without being paternalistic or participating in a type of tokenism that would wash away a foundation that we most desperately need. See, white brothers and sisters, let me try to help us. You, you finding, and I love, E. e Mace blew up a little bit on this last night. Um, if you find an African-American brother or sister who can't do it, and you put them up there because of their color, you have put us behind, not ahead. And this is my African-American, I like, I have been in multiple rooms with tears streaming down faces where brothers and sisters are like, I don't know how much longer I can do it, but let me say as a white man, if it weren't for the, the hanging in there of Dr. Eric Mason and Leon's Crump and Dwayne Bond and at the Village Church, Rob Daniel and Mike Johnny, if it weren't for the hanging in their nests, my African-American brothers and sisters, there would be no way forward for us as a white congregation. I think it has to be more than struct or more than relationships though because I'm not sure that my relationships are going to live on after me. So structures must change. I've used education as the system that I'm poking at. And by the way, I think just a revision of textbooks is the most low-lying fruit we've got. Everything else gets far more complex, but that, that seems a little easy. But what do I know? I'm a pastor, I'm not an educator. Legitimate seats at the table with real power and voice must be called out and developed. There must be space for voices to be heard without fear or fear of repercussion. In Acts 29, this means um, board positions and network director positions. It means we do not want to put on events where Anglo communicators outweigh people of color. We wanna make sure our assessment coordinators understand that we are oftentimes coming from different contexts and from different cultures, and we'll need to understand those to assess most completely. It means at the Village Church, we are going to be serious about seeking and finding gifted, godly, ferocious persons of color for legitimate power, preaching, and seats of not just voice, but shaping of culture at TBC. This has not been easy, it has not been quick. We have failed often, we have stumbled forward, oftentimes with bloody knees and tearful eyes. To give an illustration of this, just most recently, um, the, the Village Church is in the process of rolling off our multi-site um, campuses to be autonomous churches. The, another talk for another day, but uh, we feel this has been wrought by the Spirit of God through a lot of prayer and seeking the face of God. It's not a slight on that, that ecclesiology. It's just we feel like the Lord's wanting to do something different with us. And um, we, we have struggled to, to find 
men who can be a campus pastor for a season and lead into being the pastor of an autonomous church down in Dallas and out in Fort Worth. And so we, we've been looking and, and having conversations and I have called um, every African-American man I know and, and went, who you got? I need, here's what I need. Um, wait, how, how do I, wait, help me, right? We, we, I'm like, I'm, I've got a lot of white friends, a lot of, but what I, I would love to just say, here's, here's 2,000 people in an $11 million building, go lead them. And so one of the firms that's helping us find men said, let me ask you a question, Pastor Matt. If, if we find an Anglo eight and an African-American seven, which one do you want? I said, I want the African-American seven. And he said, what if we find an Anglo eight and an African-American six? And then I said, then give me the Anglo eight because the African-American six will look and feel to our people like the kind of tokenism that I'm preaching against. It's another opportunity for us to find and give power away in a way that's not paternalistic, but man, we see in you the capacity to lead and love and shape and we want you to go. Now, I, I have preached on this subject enough to know that I need to say some things here at the end, specifically to my white brothers and sisters. Um, you do not need to email me a picture of your child's social study book that has one paragraph on the Great Migration. You just don't need to do that. You, you don't need to ask me why I hate my people. I don't hate my people. I dislike fools. I am proud of my white heritage. I am saying nothing today out of white guilt. I do not feel guilty for how I was born. For how could I serve anyone if I shook my fist at the heavens that determined to make me a gangly white man <laughs> with a loud voice. I am not a political man, but I am a gospel man. In Galatians 2, 11 through 14, where we see Peter, who should have known better, drift back into his foolishness, the apostle Paul confront him with these words. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. This, again, I would point to what Jackie taught us your people are watching, white pastor, white parent. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, when I saw that their conduct, the way they were behaving, was out of step with the truth of the gospel. To Paul, this issue is not political. It is tied to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And there's a behavior that is out of step with that gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul, a Jew among Jews, a super Jew is not afraid to confront another Jew about a behavior that is out of step with the truth of the gospel. So I'm here to lovingly point out some steps that are out of step with the truth of the gospel and call us by the grace of God to gospel faithfulness in our day. I am not without hope. I am so encouraged this week. Like I, man, I've just been thinking, man, I, what kind of white people come to a conference like this? Like I, that wasn't a joke. I don't know why y'all are giggling. Because if you look at Twitter, it looked like there ain't no white people in the fight. And then here I am standing. I mean, how, how can my heart not be filled with hope? Yeah. 
We'll bleed together, brothers and sisters. And God will make the way. My hope, just as I close, is that as African Americans, you might understand more fully, not the fools, but I think the men and women that Dr. King wrote that letter from a Birmingham jail to. Well-meaning, Bible-loving, Jesus-loving, prayerful, godly folk who just are ignorant, and that's led to some immaturity. That immaturity leads to, at times, hostility, but most of the time, withdrawal. I'm not saying it's, it's right. I'm trying to help you understand why it's there. And then white pastors, I'm, again, I, I am not naive to the cost of what I'm asking, but there is no way forward if you don't say anything. Just simple, straightforward, this is God's heart. And if you get fired for biblical fidelity, man, you just joined a whole, you, you, you found yourself in Hebrews 11. You get fired for biblical fidelity. Let me pray for us. Father, my heart is full Help us. Pray for my white brothers and sisters right now, motivated by a love for you, rooted in the gospel, saturated in truth. Give us courage. If, if nothing else, confront us in our fears that we might love something more than you. We don't want to be afraid of men. We want to be fearful of you and your holiness. Pray as we finish day two and as we head into what's next that you would in your mercy and grace slowly but surely as we play the long game break things down and build things up I do pray for relationships between white churches and black churches that are not paternalistic, but an environment where we might learn from one another, build one another up in love, pour into one another with no strings attached other than um, our brotherly, sisterly affection for one another. I thank you that I'm not asking you to do anything that would be difficult for you. So I pray that you would break bondage yet again, spiritual bondage, intellectual bondage. That you'd grant us wisdom for the way forward. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. God bless.